Hello everyone and welcome to episode 341 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How's it going today, Richard? Hey Seth, doing well, doing well, recovered. No, I'm not recovering from any preview season. <laughs> We're just like straight in the middle of like two preview seasons. Why not? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, spoilers, they, they just keep coming. Spoilers into spoilers, and we got new cards to talk about this week for our new post-rotation standard set, Innistrad Midnight Hunt. That's one of our big topics for today. But before we get into that, we got another co-host in Krim. What's up today, Krim? Morning, Seth. Uh, like Richard had mentioned, and like the oh, wise, wise philosopher uh, known as Smash Mouth would always say, they don't stop coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes that, that song was definitely about spoilers yeah, <laughs> they were dead <yeah>. on <laughs> that's that's the whole reason why all-star was written <laughs> well uh, we do have spoilers to talk about and talk about them we shall uh we had an early sneak peek spoiler day and wizard spoiled like seven cards and the basic lands but all the cards are kind of insane, but we'll get to that in a minute. So in the Stride Midnight Hunt spoilers, topic number one, we want to talk a little bit about the pacing of spoilers. There was an interesting article by Jim Davis this week talking about things that could kill magic, one of magic players' favorite topics. And one of the things he brought up was product fatigue. And that combined with our constant stream of spoilers in secret layers seems like an interesting topic. So we want to talk about that a bit. And then of course, answer your fish mail questions. So that's the plan for today. But before we get into it, a reminder that our show today is brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit, you've probably heard about them from us before. They're a great way to sell your magic collection. And they're offering a new service that's geared towards selling smaller batches of valuable cards with a reduced service fee. With their curated shipment service, you can sell cards at the best available buy list price with only a 5% fee. And as with all of Card Conduit services, you don't got to sort your cards, you don't got to grade them, you can just safely package them up, ship them out, and you'll even get a detailed report with the results. So you can check out Card Conduit's curated shipment option as a way to buy list up to 150 cards with fast processing, optimized prices, and and the low service fee of just 5%. And right now, you can even get a 10% discount by heading over to cardconduit.com slash goldfish. Card Conduit, they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards. So thank you so much to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And uh, let's talk some Innistrad Midnight Hunt. So there was a sneak peek wizard stream, uh, kind of by surprise last week, showing off the new set, official spoilers, end of the month, set release, end of September in paper, beginning of September in digital, but they showed off seven new cards and they kind of blew me away. Like I'm just shocked at the cards that we're seeing in this set. So let's start with spoilers and talk about these new cards. Richard, guide us through some Innistrad Midnight Hunt. All right, Innistrad Midnight Hunt previews. Um, yeah, you can find them at MTG previews. We've already removed the jumpstart. Forget jumpstart historic. That didn't happen. Uh, we got the full set last week, by the way. So if you're curious about that, you can uh, you can check that out. But we're already on to the next standard set. First up, uh, Mythic Green Planeswalker specialty for Krim. We have Ren <laughs> and Seven. Three green green, so five mana value, five starting loyalty, legendary planeswalker, Ren has four abilities. Plus one, reveal the top four cards of your library, put all lands revealed this way into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Zero, put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. Minus three, create a green tree folk creature token with reach and this creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. Minus eight, return all permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. You get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. <laughs> oh boy. I, I thought this I thought this was a meme at first. Uh, this seems like a custom card joke that you would uh, see on Reddit or something, Ren and Seven, but apparently it's like a real flavor thing and Ren like has these host trees that he goes to and in modern horizons he was on the sixth one and now he's on the seventh one or something like that so apparently it's not a joke i, I at first i thought this was a meme card the card itself though 
is kind of insane like this seems like a really powerful card it is five mana so i don't think it's going to be broken like oko or anything like that but all of the abilities are relevant the tree folk token that it makes assuming we don't have like a brazen borrower type card to really punish uh you know tokens in the format is actually huge like i looked for creatures that have power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control and those are usually like five six seven mana beanstalk giant style creatures so that token is huge and really valuable it generate card advantage it protects itself and then the ultimate doesn't really win the game but if you're drawing you know five or ten cards from your graveyard hopefully that actually does win the game so great for like landfall style decks but i think this card might be good enough that you can just play it as like a generic green planeswalker like vivian or something where it's just like eh, i got a couple slots left might as well throw ren and seven into the deck i think it does enough that you don't even have to really be built around its synergies for it to be playable i i, I despise this card <laughs> <laughs> really it, like nissa despise or just normal green card despise norm, normal green <laughs> card despise this doesn't look like nissa broken yet uh, we'll see what else comes out with the set, but right now I, I, I much like Seth thought this was a fake card. I, I legit thought this was like a troll card by like Reds or Reddit or something like that. But I do think that the card is powerful and yeah, no, no brazen borrower. So that token's going to be pretty beefy. Uh, and now maybe what's that, what's that card from Strixhaven body of mind? Oh, Ooh, yeah. Yes. So, that, that actually works really well with Ren and Six. Just make all the big things and hope seven, for the best. That actually seven, sounds like a sweet dad. Or Ren and, yeah. Seven. You get, seven. You count up. Next, it'll be eight. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I know. I mean, th this this card does seem very, very powerful. Um, So I, I don't know exactly what it looks like in the new meta. Um, But as of right now, I mean, there's nothing like a brazen bar to kill the token. No super duper uh hyper efficient way to dunk planeswalkers right now is there what, what's the planeswalker removal looking like e2 extinction is left uh yeah losing like murderous rider of Mur course yeah. um i think there's a bunch of like damage based red removal spells that can burn like, like planeswalkers or, or burn yeah stuff like that but i i don't know if there's much outside of e2 extinction that's just like hard you know hard removal for a planeswalker Right, like so, like what? There's only like blood snow, and that's six mana. I'm not really sure what the planeswalker removal is. Maybe it's slipping my mind right now. But uh, yeah, does if if this is the case, then maybe planeswalkers are kind of good again. Yeah, I mean, I think as far as a is a home, this seems insane in landfall decks, and I actually think landfall might be one of the decks that gets a lot better there's some really strong landfall cards from zendikar you probably remember when zendikar rising first came out and like it dominated with omnath and then it kind of faded away but stuff like lotus cobra or even like scoot swarm becomes a lot more exciting without bone crusher giant running around and this seems built for a landfall deck like plus <sighs> to hit your land drops to trigger landfall zero to put a bunch of lands into play all at once and get a ton of landfall triggers and then also you know making big tokens or whatever but i I think that's the most obvious home is like you ramp into this with lotus cobra and then this just supports all your landfall payoffs so i think that could be maybe the best home for it immediately in standard yeah uh i kind of forgot that card like that entire archetype and that set still exists so <laughs> i guess yeah <laughs> and blood chief's thirst is going to be currently one of the uh planeswalker answers i think this card is so good that you don't care about really any of the abilities of the possibilities that you don't care about landfall, right? Like you just poop out a four, four, if you ramped a five, five with reach, which pretty much blocks everything, right? Like gold span dragon, whatever, right? doesn't matter. Yeah. And you just plus doesn't matter what the plus actually is. But in this case, it's actually insane because you get to fuel your graveyard for some reason. Uh, but you get lands, you get to feel your graveyard, and then you just poop out another token, and your tokens get bigger as the game progress. Uh, they're very hard to attack through, like flyers don't get through them. Uh, so I don't think you actually need landfall. I think this is just good enough in a generic vacuum that you would play it. Uh, it's like very resilient. It creates big creatures. It defends against flyers. Uh, and you just... You just do green things. You just make some tokens and 
beat them down and they can't handle it, right? So I actually think this is really strong. And if you have any landfall synergies, it gets better, but I don't think you even need them. Shutting down Goldspan is huge. Like, uh, yeah. if there's one thing we've learned from Standard 2022, it's that Goldspan's probably the number one threat heading into post-rotation Standard. And Reach seems like an incidental, like, throwaway ability, but in a world of Goldspan and all the other dragons from, like, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, that actually seems like a huge upgrade side for Ren and Seven. What about outside of standard? Is five mana just a deal breaker for formats like modern or is there a chance it could show up there too? <laughs> I don't think this is going outside of uh, standard. Yeah. Is, is Tron going to play this? How are you going to get the five mana? <laughs> like five yeah. mana is a lot. It better win the game on the spot, which it doesn't. Oh. And it does oh. not. And then you have fatal pushes that kill the tokens. So yeah, yeah probably, and, probably and not Brazen Borrower hasn't modern. left uh, modern. So <laughs> I, I do have a question for Richard about this card, though. Is Strangle, Strangle Root, Geist. Root Geist better? Yes, because I can cast it in modern. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. All right. But I, I think this is very good, though. This card is very good. Whereas I think Red and Six is situationally good. But I think this card, like for sta- in the context of standards, is really good. Red and Six is situationally good in modern. Um, you still haven't come around on Ren and Six, have you, Richard? No. It's been like two years. I figured you, uh, sooner or later you would come around to its power, it, it's but good still not yet. in certain contexts. When you can, when the minus one is relevant, it's good. When the minus one is not relevant, it's useless, right? So when the meta is full of minus ones, uh, you know, that, then it's really good. But when it's not, like you play anything over it. Uh, we'll see how Ren and 8 will stack up to uh, this. Or maybe we go backwards. Maybe we go Ren and 5. Maybe Ren and 5 will be Stranger Root Geist. <laughs> the Without origin the tree. set. It just runs no, around no, with haste. <laughs> when we return to, like, what is it, MTG Origins, that's when we're going to find Ren and 1. <laughs> uh, all right. Next up, we have uh, a one-drop zombie, Champion of the Perished. So Champion of the Perished, uh, it's a creature zombie, it's a rare, it's a 1-1, one, one. whenever another zombie enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on Champion of the Perished. I love this card. I think this card is the, probably flavor-wise, hilariously awesome, as Champion of the Parish from Innistrad uh, has now come back. <laughs> as a zombie uh, card. And I think it's been a while since we've had some zombie support and I am excited. And of course, almost not really surprised at all that Innistrad has zombie support uh, because yeah, we, we've got a few, a few zombie cards already, right? Like Accelerac or whatever from the D and D set. Uh, we've got a bunch of other zombies li- lying around and none of them are really all that good yet because there's no support for it but maybe Innistrad changes that and this is a start yeah I think for standard I mean this card's insane this card's super insane I actually think champion of the parish might be better as a zombie like I think the tribe might support it better than humans support the effect as far as standard I'm kind of like wait and see mode Uh, Innistrad does tend to have zombie themes so I could certainly see It making it in standard based on uh, what we get in both of the Innistrad sets. Although, currently, I don't know. The zombies that are going to be in standard from the other sets that aren't rotating are kind of meh-ish. Like, not super exciting. Uh, There's not, like, a real lord. I think there's one of uncommon four-mana one for zombies and skeletons. But uh, So, I feel like... Blue-black zombies. I guess this... Yeah, okay. Okay, the snow one could actually be decent. I guess that that could be a possibility. King so I feel like we need we need more zombies to actually make it good in standard. On the other hand, in modern, maybe even in legacy, I think this card is going to be huge. Like, I think this card makes zombies into a real modern deck. It might actually make it into a, a legacy deck even, but I think it's, like, incredibly powerful with the cards that zombies in modern already want to be playing. Like, most of the zombie decks in modern, you're kind of, like, getting value out of, like, Goblin Bombardment or, like, sacrificing Grave Crawler repeatedly or Giralf's Messenger, these sacrifice type synergies, and that's zombies entering the battlefield like crazy. Like, 
Like one of the ways zombies wins is just sacking grave crawler to carry and feeder and keep recasting the grave crawler to make your carry and feeder huge, triggering other stuff along the way. Champion of the Paris just sits out as you're doing all your typical zombie shenanigans, and suddenly it's gonna be a 10-10 for one or something. Like it's gonna get big so quickly. So I'm definitely very much looking forward to what this card's gonna do in uh, in non-standard formats. Maybe it makes it in standard, which would be sweet, but in modern and older formats, I think this card is a really big deal. I, I also have a very, I have a good feeling about zombies in historic. They, they're kind of a meme right now, but you have Crypt Breaker, you'll have this. Uh, you don't have Grave Crawler, but that's fine. And you have, you know, your, your lords out of the Amonkhet and then Diagraph Colossus is coming in from Jumpstart. So, uh, I do, I do think historic is going to have a real zombie deck. Yeah, I really like this card. I must admit, I have tried turning my Cauldra Blade deck into a zombie deck at times, where I'm like, hmm, <laughs> I'm already running Charles Messenger. Uh, what if I put some Grave Crawlers in? And like, what if I just add like, you know, what if all the non, you know, Stone Forge Mystic creatures are zombies? And uh, it didn't really work out, but. It could be a thing. The The problem is you need two drop zombies. They, they kind of all suck. There's nothing like very good, but maybe Champion of the Perished is your two drop zombie. <laughs> you just play more one drops that get big and call it a day. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to see if zombies has enough. If we just get another like OP mythic or rare zombie card, uh, it might be enough to make it into a legit deck. Uh, flavor, flavor pun, up or down. I was kind of surprised. Like it's, it's been a little controversial when the card was, uh, was spoiled. Some people think that the champion of the parish, like pun, is hilarious. Other people were uh, kind of booing and like, oh, what a, you know, cheesy pun. Where, where do you come down on, on the name and the flavor? I love it. This is amazing. <laughs> I don't even. <laughs> It's great. It's not forced. It's not like this card makes no sense. Like if you didn't know about the other card, this name would be perfectly fine, right? Like th there's nothing wrong with it. So I don't know why people are complaining. I I like it too. I think it's hilarious, and it and, and it does fit. Like you could have a card champion of the parish and without any reference, and it would still work. And the abilities would fit. So I think it, it's a super like sweet nostalgic callback. And that's one thing we've seen through the bit of spoilers uh, that we've gotten so far is Wizard said they're they're going back to the basics for Innistrad. They're going back to 20, 2011, 10 years ago. Oh, my goodness. We've been doing this for a long time, guys. You mean they're going back to um, 2021 magic? <laughs> yes. We're, we're, going, we're going back to 2021, but they're going back to, like, the original flavor in the gothic horror, which makes me even more excited for oh. these Innistrad sets. Do not even get me started on how much I love the gothic look of this set and the horror movie themes, like how you look at Ren and Seven and it looks like, you know, fall, like autumn, all that stuff, the lands, everything. And there, some of this stuff also has like horror movie vibes, like movies that I've seen. So definitely love it. Yeah, I feel they've learned, right? They've learned from like Zendikar and... Uh, Battle for Zendikar and Shadows Over Innistrad where if you say you're going to return to a plane you can't just throw like Eldrazi on it and make it feel like an Eldrazi set then people are like why are we on well, this plane it doesn't feel like the plane at all like what are we even doing here right so how, how they've learned you know unless they drop like some Praetors here for some reason which uh, at least Praetors are on theme I guess kind of right uh, maybe <laughs> but you know how I, I do you know, know right? that Richard I'm just <laughs> because Emrakul could still be here <laughs> yeah yeah oh. actually actually Mark Rosewater confirmed no Eldrazi in either set so yeah, but what if oh, Emrakul isn't goodness. an Eldrazi what if Emrakul is <laughs> Ren and Seven Oh, What's the Ren theory? And Ren and Eldrazi. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Ren and Eldrazi. I mean, look, <laughs> what was that theory uh, a while back? Like uh, the Wanderer was Emrakul. Like this. This is <laughs> Ren. Ren is Emrakul. We figured. Yeah. We cracked it. <laughs> figured it out. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Triska Decafile. Two mana value. One in a blue. It's a one-three human wizard at rare. You have no maximum hand size. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have exactly 13 cards in your hand, you win the game. Three and a blue draw card. I, I think this card this is actually good. I think this card got power you, crept. <laughs> you think it's good? You think it's good in uh, in standard? I think it's yeah. obviously good in commander. Like you think it's standard playable? Uh, Interesting. Well, I, I, I think it's really good in commander. 
uh, like like oh, amazing yeah. in Commander. And, but I also think in Standard, there's enough things to like potentially just get you to perfectly 13 cards. And it itself, having that activated ability, is quite nice. I mean, we saw Azure Mage be playable. That was apparently a long time ago. And right. I sometimes think I... Was it actually playable <sighs> Magic is Standard? Ch- it it did see standard play. Like Azure Mage was in like standard decks. I think it was a sideboard card that would come in uh, in control decks for certain matchups. So it wasn't as stable, but it was a card that people actually like played in tournaments. That was ten years ago. Is it fast enough? I do like that it's a one three. That makes it a little bit more resilient to uh, early game removal, like shock effects or bone crusher giant style effects, which is thankfully rotating. And it makes her a better blocker against aggro. And there's probably ways to get to thirteen cards in standard. I think we're this really shines though is in commander Commander. in commander it's a mana sink no max hand size is an effect people want anyway lots of reliquary towers in the format and it seems so easy to just like blue sun zenith on the end step before your turn and go up to 13 cards or sphinx's revelation or brain guys or any of those big x card draw spells and just win the game this might be the easiest alternate win condition to pull off in commander uh, outside of thassa's oracle and it's it's not thassa's oracle it's not that busted you still gotta wait to the upkeep but it might actually be second place i think as far as how easy it is to achieve this in commander yeah I, this, I and this is another alternate win condition for anala so before yeah. your upkeep, you need 13 cards, right? So you need to fire off at end step. You can't do it on your upkeep. And then as the trigger resolves, you need 13 cards. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if there's a battle where you use, you expend cards from your hand, uh, it's not going to work, right? You need 13 cards exactly. So, and like, if you've drawn 13 cards, you probably won the game. Like, I don't know, right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like... I I, I like, should be living in, proof in the, that that's in not true. In the best case, you have seven already, <laughs> and you draw six, right? But in the worst case, you have to draw a fresh thirteen. Either way, you're in a pretty good spot. Like, do you need this card? Like, do you play Azure Mage in your commander decks? Like, yes, I I do actually. Uh, do you actually? I, oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I don't. Won't. But in Wizards and mono blue decks, yeah, like in whatnot. Wizards where this has a lot of innate synergy, yeah, but like in a vacuum, like I don't know that you'd play this. Like Azure Mage is I, the same thing, and like who it's, cares? It's it's very upgraded Azure Mage though. Like no max hand size, like that is an upgrade, and then better stats is a bit of an upgrade and azure mage is never going to accidentally win you the game i do see what you're saying though it is true like if you have you know 13 cards in hand do you need a win condition but i i play so many like dirtily low power decks of like casting mold drifters and cloud blazers i think i actually do like i imagine that there would be many games that i would win if i had this card in my deck that i wouldn't win otherwise because i'm just drawing more card draw spells like this is this is your payoff for just casting all the cards draw spells it actually rewards you for doing that in a way that uh that wins the game potentially immediately Uh, the counter thing is a bit of an issue maybe there's a way to work around that like if you have a instant speed discard outlet then you can you know drop to 15 or something and if you got a force of will something you still got the 13 cards if not you just discard you know a couple of cards so maybe there's a way to work around it but i actually think like even if it's not insane what else is even close to being this easy as far as an alternate win condition like you have thassa's oracle what else like none of the other ones see play they're like super ultra janky like it, it, compared to the rest of the field i still think even if this isn't busted it's still like better than the other options or easier than the other options eh. Fellow deer gar- no, what is the one? Fellow deer sovereign. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah, get a, I, I it's six saying, mana, but, but yeah. I, I feel this is a trap. Most players will put this in and they'll very rarely win with this trigger and you probably won't even use the four mana draw card, right? You probably have better things to do with your mana, so it'll just get removed and swept up at some point. Um but probably. it could work. It could work in like a thirteen deck, I mean, right? When you have I other thirteen triggers. You, I'm gonna I'm going to put this in my commander deck. <laughs> it's going to happen on commander. Be, it'll be really season. good at wizards. I think it'll be really good at wizards, but outside yeah. of wizards. <laughs> and flavor, flavor again. Awesome. Like another callback to old Innistrad, the uh, motif of the number 13, Triskaidekaphobia. So another just like nostalgia flavor hit for me. 
there's got to be a card where you need 13 of everything 13 cards in hand 13 like permanents on the battlefield 13 life and then like you win the next 10 games yeah, <laughs> yeah. you just win the tournament you win the tournament. Yeah. <laughs> pro tour champion i'm 10 and 0 uh all right next up we have infernal grasp one in a black Two mana value, yes. instant, uncommon, destroy target creature, you lose two life. Yes, God, yes, I love this card. It is, I'm probably going to lose to that you lose two life more often than not. But the thing here is, I, Infernal Grasp is an absurd Doom Blade, right? It has no restriction, it doesn't care if it's an artifact, it's just at the cost of two life. Now, there are ways to gain life back, so maybe cards like Cling to Dust will get really even just so much more important than it ever was. Uh, but like, yeah, like that, this is the removal spell. Yeah, I, I think that Infernal Grasp is the best Doom Blade we've ever seen. We've seen like the the terror slash doom blade power creep where in the early days it couldn't hit black or artifact creatures then it was doom blade it could only not hit black creatures then we had like go for the throw everything but artifacts most recently heartless summoning pretty good anything but counters and this is the first two mana black removal spell we've seen that's just straight up kill anything for two mana at instant speed sure you lose two life i don't think that's a deal breaker i think if you're playing heartless act or in older formats a lesser version of this or even in Commander, where you have 40 life and losing 2 life is not a big deal. This is a premium removal spell. Like, this is the best version of this effect that they've ever printed, in my opinion. Like, I think this beats out all the other options, and it'll see a ton of play in Standard. And I think uh, Heartless Act sees a lot of play in Historic and Pioneer, and a tiny bit in Modern. I think this just replaces it in most of those decks. I mean, yeah. what, what are the other ones up for? Go for the Throat. Heartless Act. Terminate. Terminates two colors. You gotta be two colors. What's the vampire yeah. one? Like the double black oh, can't kill. Uh, victim, victim, of, victim, of night. victim of the night. night. Like <laughs> that's kind of your dismember, maybe. Like it's up there, right? Like for two mana removal, like this is one of the best ones. So, I do yeah. worry about it in modern because you are already at a very low health total. I don't I mean, know how I much you have so much removal in modern that you don't really need it, but at the same time, yeah. A lot of decks win by just having like six CMC creatures and they're like, huh, nice fatal push and lightning bolt. And you just like run rampant with like your stupid like six mana five five or something, right? So this actually gets around that. But two life is a lot in modern. I mean, I think if it's a format where the next best option, probably Heartless Act, let's say, doesn't really see play, then this is less appealing. I don't think, like, this is going to become a modern or legacy staple, just because, in general, like, two-mana removal isn't, like, staple-level cards anymore. Uh, but I do think if, uh, in other formats where that effect is, a, like, staple and it sees playing a ton of decks, then I think this just replaces the other options for the most part. I really dislike this card, by the way. Uh, we, we've hinted at it, but this Ooh. just means your creatures have to be insane, right? Mm -hmm. And we know what that means, right? We've seen Eldraine, right? Like, your creatures will come with ETBs and, like, they'll be super resistant to removal because anyone can just fire off two mana removal. Why play a five drop that dies and does nothing? It must do, like, 800 things as it enters the battlefield. Uh, so this I, having this powerful we're due removal... For I feel like we're due for an overcorrection, though. We've had a bunch of sets where, like, the threats beat the answers. Maybe we're going to have a, a standard where the answers beat the threats. Like, that would be something different that we haven't seen in a while. I don't think we'd ever have that. Would we ever have that? Like, you would make no progress. Everyone would be playing Drago, <laughs> like, empty boards, and someone bills out, right? <laughs> That sounds like Krim's uh, dream format. I, lo I love that format, so I don't... I, I mean, I hope we get Nefalia Drown Yard back, okay? So, <laughs> uh, All right, next up, we have Join the Dance, a Selesnia card, green and white, two mana value, sorcery, create two human creature uh, tokens, flashback for five, three green and a white. So two mana, I guess, sorcery raise the alarm with flashback for five. So first off, this is one of the artworks that I thought was pretty cool. It had very Midsummer vibes, uh, if you've seen that horror movie from A24. 
Uh, and then on top of that, this means flashback is, well, back. And I am really excited for that because that was a pretty cool mechanic. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Jordan the Dance is decent. Like, we see cards like Raise the Alarm Sea play, uh, Gather the Townsfolk back from original Innistrad or Dark Ascension Saw play. So two tokens for two mana is a pretty big, uh, a, a pretty playable effect. Like, sure, you got to be a token deck. You're not going to slam in every deck. The tokens are humans. Innistrad usually has a human theme. So maybe we get, you know, some human payoffs that make it even better. But the most interesting part is, and I didn't even realize this till Wizards mentioned on their stream, they have never made multicolor flashback cards in the game's history. This is the first set where they've done multicolor flashback. So even though this card, I think, is it's good at what it does, but it's nothing earth shattering. I think that multicolor flashback probably opens up some interesting design possibilities that we haven't seen before, because multicolor cards tend to be pushed a little more. Wizards tend to think like, oh, you got to pay two colors so we can make it more powerful. So maybe we see some really strong flashback stuff in the set. Combos with red and seven plus one <laughs> goes to your graveyard with all your ample lands. Flash it back. Um, the flashback but, is a lot, though. It's like five, right? Five is not. I mean, yeah. that's what you pay for season Pyromancer and you're happy about it. Uh, but yeah, that's true. The, the token thing will depend if we have the support cards. Typically, we have some like insane cards to support tokens when they're viable. Uh, things like Gideon, things like. The, the three men and Nyssa going back to Gaviny Township on the first way around. So two mana, make two humans is okay, but you really do need the support cards to, to pump it up. Uh, next up, we have a mono red card, play with fire, a single red instant at uncommon. Deal two damage to any target. If a player was dealt damage this way, scry one. I mean, uh, what Inferno Grasp is to Doom Blades, this card is to to Shocks. Basically, it's just the best Shock that they've ever made in Shock. I see his play back to what Pioneer Burn. I think yeah. plays it historic Wait, uh, standard, play obviously. Shock Pioneer. Oh, jeez. Well, they play <laughs> Wild Slash or whatever, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, and th yeah, that yeah. does prevent damage. Uh, for, or, uh, it stops damage from being prevented. Uh, this. Does look really good, though. Like, having the ability to scry after sending it upstairs seems kind of absurd. Yeah, it's I mean, it does everything Shock does and then more. So if you're playing Shock in your historic deck or whatever, standard deck, like, you just play this instead because it's actually just strictly better? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's better than Shock, but it's, like, still Shock, right? Like, okay, you have <laughs> Lightning Bolt if you care about older formats, and then you also have Bone Crusher Giant, which technically... Is not a shock. It costs two, but it's a shock for one more mana and a four three body afterwards. So it's it's okay. It's like an upgraded shock, but we've had better, well, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. If if you play shock though, much like Seth mentioned, you, there's just no reason to play it anymore because play with fire is better. Do we think this is standard yeah, playable? Think... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, shock, oh yeah. Shock sees a decent amount of standard play. I think it depends on the meta, but right yeah. now, Shoxy standard play in mono red, in is it tempo, in various like red aggro style decks. So if Shock is playable, as long as there's a deck to support it, which there probably will be, then this is even more playable. Although I do agree with what you're saying, Richard. Adding Scry to Shock doesn't make it like modern playable or legacy playable. It's still two damage for one mana, but that's good enough for several formats but not modern or not legacy in specific but it's definitely good enough for standard and historic and maybe a little bit in pioneer all right uh next up we have consider a single blue <laughs> mana one mana value instant look at the top card of your library you may put that card into your graveyard draw a card so surveil so ver one. surveil without the keyword surveil yeah. opt Basically. And then draw a card. This has to be better than opt, right? Like, I mean, oh, oftentimes, yeah. like, because I, I think this goes back into modern because you will l gladly throw a card into your graveyard. This yep. this is just an amazing one drop spell. We've talked about a lot of good cards today. This is the card that I would say we'll see the most play out of the cards we've talked about. I think this is 
an immediate four of from standard all the way back to modern. There's already decks like uh, there's Snapcaster control decks, there's storm decks that are already playing four ops all the way back to modern. And the same is true in pioneer spell style decks, Phoenix style decks, various control decks in historic in standard opt is kind of like a key tank cran trip. There's a ton of decks that play opt in standard and putting a card into the graveyard is in like 99% of those decks in upside. Like that's an improvement. If you're playing arc light Phoenix, you want cards in your graveyard or snapcaster you want cards in your graveyard so even though it's like a small upgrade it's a really meaningful upgrade so i think this is just a, a staple level cantrip all the way back to modern uh, you're gonna see a ton of play probably replacing opt in a lot of decks or maybe even alongside opt in some decks I mean, we, I know that this set, it's an old one. Uh, how long has it been out now? Like maybe like half a month. Uh, the D&D &D set. Uh, <laughs> De Demolich is actually in that set. And this seems perfect, right? Like you, you yeah. can pitch your Demolich and then that's already a spell. You've cast it, so it'll cost one less. This will be in your yard. Uh, and it helps you get more Demoliches in your yard. There, there's. It looks like they're already setting up for some kind of cheap like blue red deck because you'll have you know whatever new shock play with fire you'll have this you'll you'll there have more than enough ways to get demo liches yeah, it definitely seems good with demo liches. Uh, uh, and maybe that makes demolish into a thing in standard. This card's it's it's really really good. It's really good. I'm surprised they printed this. Like a, a lot of times they nerf cards by not allowing them to dump into graveyard. Uh, so so far we've already seen two cards that just dump directly into graveyard. Uh, so I think that's going to have a lot of ramifications for older formats like Modern and Legacy, where uh, that is a, a big positive. Um, probably, probably not like get pro broken, right? But I expect it to. You, I expect to see this in a lot of decks uh, with the ability to just cantrip and then just dump cards into graveyard. So question, I think that's all of our spoiler cards. So question about these cards in general and what we've seen from Ministrat in general. It seems like every card we talked about was uh, good to great. Some of them being like the best version of what they are that has ever been printed, like consider for an opt or play with fire for a shock. What do you think about what this says of the power level of the set? We were a couple of weeks ago talking about how, you know, post rotation standard is going to be powered down. We lose all the busted sets. Do you have any fear or concern that Innistrad is actually just going to be a super push set and it's going to keep Adventures in the Forgotten Realms and Strixhaven and Keldheim, all those sets that have been waiting for their chance to shine in standard, just keep them out of the format similarly to how Eldraine did. Like, is this just going to be a super high powered set, the most powerful set that we have in standard after rotation? I, it, it looks like it will be the most, like, answer-wise, it has some of the best answers, so uh, there has to be a reason for that, and it looks like it will be the most powerful set in Standard. Do I think it'll lock out uh, all the other sets? No, because Eldraine, there is no other Eldraine. Uh, <laughs> I'll clip this. Someone clip this. Oh boy! Yeah, yeah. Yes, call, uh, called shot here. <laughs> called shot here. This ki there's no way this could be more powerful than Eldraine. <laughs> like Eldraine, you would have to show me something better than Oko. You would have to show me something better than Once Upon a Time and all the things that come with it. This whole set, like just Eldraine, is I I, I hope. There is no other set that is as powerful as Eldraine. So, and I just, just look by looking at these cards, I can already tell you that Doomblade doesn't come with a 4 3. So, like, <laughs> th this is. That's a, that actually, is a good point, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. I am unscathed. I'm like, oh, whatever, sure. <laughs> so, so here's my counterpoint to you. You guys can start recording your top 10 modern cards today and be like half done without like <laughs> without any issue. We've yeah. talked about like seven cards and at least three have strong arguments for being played back to modern. Right. And if we were going like pioneer or historic, then maybe you're up to like five. Right. The power level seems very strong. I would just throw away your Strixhaven and uh, <laughs> Ralph's Forgotten cards because I don't know that they're going to be high powered enough. Maybe this is not Eldraine, but is it like post-nerf, post-nerf, post-nerf Eldraine? 
You know, like after the third round of bannings, is this a strong, <laughs> right? And I, I, it looks uh, pretty strong to me. Like, like Kirk said, I mean, if I the f- answers are this strong, what are the threats, right? The threats have got to be scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> the, other, the other possibility is they just previewed like the best cards in the set, which seems kind of like a long shot for a sneak peek <laughs> early access day that they would just like show off all the strongest cards but you never know with the with how wizards of spoilers these days weird weird things happen with spoilers so maybe this is just all the best cards they just had a top 10 list and read it read them off for the sneak peek stream the other reason i think innistrad might dominate though is we're getting those two sets back to back like a month and a half apart and that means uh some of the synergies are theoretically going to carry over well we're kind of going back to the two set block thing that we haven't had in a long time so if there's you know flashback support or zombies or whatever they're going to have two sets of innistrad to help make that tribe or that deck good enough for standard when strixhaven keldheim they all only kind of get one you only got one sets of giants or whatever so they might be at a little disadvantage uh, just because there's more of innistrad and uh, that means more support for the sets themes but Hopefully it'll be fine. I, I don't think it's Eldraine. I'm not worried about it at this point, like breaking the format. But based on these early uh, spoilers, it does seem like it's going to be the most powerful set in standard. So I have a question for you, Seth. You follow the finance updates from Hasbro. Does the fall set, is it included in Q4 sales numbers? It must be, right? Uh, Yes, generally. Yeah. It depends on the exact release date. Uh, but in, I think that it can sometimes be the end of uh, Q3, actually, because of how the dates uh, break down. But yes, uh, in general, it is. Yeah, that I, I think this set will be super pushed to inflate sales. Because I, I was trying to think, like, why would they do this, right? They must know that the fall set is the set that stays in standard the longest, right? So if you want to print, like, broken cards, this is not the time to do it, right? Because it's going to sit in standard, like, basically forever, uh, but on the other side, if you want your Q4 numbers to look really good, right? You want your end of year numbers to look really good, then this is the perfect time, right? This is when everyone like dumps their advertising money in and like tries to pump up the numbers in one last hurrah for the end of year numbers. And then in that sense, it makes a lot of sense to make this like super broken and super pushed. So I don't know. I, I feel like it's yeah. going to be super pushed. <laughs> I, I almost wonder if that's why there's two sets, too, and why they change the scheduling. Like, you know what'll drive up your bottom line at the end of the year? How about releasing two sets instead of just one? Like, that's a good way to, you know, have the numbers look good. So, anyway, so should one, I throw one away other my question. AFR card set? <laughs> what is the answer? <laughs> I, I, no, I, I haven't I even finished my pre order. Should I even bother with the pre orders? <laughs> I. I would not throw away my AFR cards. I'm sure yeah. I, I'm still very, for, I, I have very high hopes for a standard, but I do think that I, what we're seeing so far out of Innistrad does suggest that the themes that it supports are probably going to be really good. And it, it does make me feel a little bit less confident that like giants or some of these other tribes that I was like, oh, it'll be cool rotation. They're probably going to be good. Now I'm thinking like, oh, it's it's probably going to be zombies and humans and whatever is going on in Innistrad because these cards just look so strong. But I think you still want to you're still going to need those cards. Hopefully they're still going to be pretty playable. I don't I don't think this set's going to invalidate those sets. You'll, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'm going to clip this for my personal library. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you can all <laughs> definitely play it back for me when I'm complaining in a week. It <laughs> could be circle of loyalty. It could be it could be circle of loyalty. We never Look, know. <laughs> we if never there, know. If there's going to be a problematic card from this set, it's going to be in green. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I call, I'm calling it now. There's going to be a green card that is going to drive me up a wall and it's going to be absurd. <laughs> But I I do think that a Forgotten Realm still has cards you're going to want. There's no way Lolf doesn't get some love. And then I I also think that Demolich is just looking to shape up to get more and more, uh, you know, more and more playables to go into that deck. Uh, Of course, Ranger class is still big. All the class effects have have proven to be pretty powerful. So you're going to still want the Forgotten Realm stuff. And some of these cards help older themes. Like, uh, I know I was trying to build post-rotation, like, Magecraft-style decks. Prowess kind of, like, sling a bunch of spells and trigger your Magecraft stuff. And they just lack cheap spells. Like, that's there was no opt in the format. And I was like, man, it's really hard to build a 
this Magecraft deck because I just don't have like cheap card draw or cheap removal spells. So things like Consider, like I'm sure it's going to help with some graveyard theme from Innistrad, but that's also a key card if you want to build like a Strixhaven based Magecraft aggro style deck. Same with Play with Fire. So uh, I guess that's the good news that the cards that are really strong, like Inferno Grass, Play with Fire, Consider, those aren't cards for a specific deck or archetype. Those are just cards that are solid support cards for a whole bunch of uh, different archetypes. So hopefully their power will be like spread across decks rather than concentrated on like one busted archetype, which I think uh, I think that would uh, end up being a good thing. Uh, all right, one one other question for you about spoilers. Uh, this was our other topic before we get to fish mail. So uh, obviously we've been talking about Innistrad spoilers. Last week we were talking about Jumpstart Historic Horizon spoilers. Uh, my my story last week Wednesday we got the full set of Jumpstart Historic Horizons, and I was working on uh, my big like crafting review article and video, which is up on the site. You should check it out if you're interested in collecting Jumpstart Historic Horizons, if that's still a thing people care about anymore. Uh, but then as I was working on that, the literally the day that spoiler season ended, was there like, hey, guess what? Tomorrow Innistrad spoilers, and then 24 hours hours later we're into Innistrad and before that Jumpstart Historic Horizons came out very shortly after Adventures in the Forgotten Realms like had a week or two and then all of a sudden like hey surprise this 800 card set we're spoiling it like starting in a couple of days and before that it was Modern Horizons a couple of weeks uh, before Adventures in Forgotten Realm so spoilers are coming at an unprecedented pace like we have never seen we've never seen this before like it, this is the fastest it's ever been I know Jim Davis over on uh, Cool Stuff Inc. wrote an article this week about stuff that could kill magic. And the first thing he mentioned was product fatigue and just spoiler fatigue and too many cards coming out too quickly, uh, ending up causing people to, to tune everything out, essentially. Uh, what do you think about the speed that we're going from set to set these days? Like, is it uh, is this constant stream of hype and starting a new spoiler season super early a day after the last spoiler season? Is it too much for the community? Do you like it uh, because you get to see new cards all the time? What are your feelings about just the rapidly increasing space of uh, pace of set releases and spoilers? OK, so if you ask me, like, is how does the community feel about it? I feel like us as enfranchised players uh, will probably be, you know, experience a product fatigue because we have our ear on the ground. We're always caught up on everything or trying to be, you know, and especially since we're making content for it to the average person, this is actually pretty cool. Um, and this is something I've actually asked a few, uh, people that have just started magic and I'm like, did you know this new sets out? And they're like, no, not really, but that's awesome. That's just more new cards. So to somebody that isn't all magic all the time this is great right there's always something new for them to come back to to get into uh, and I, I could totally see that point of view however do I personally like that I mean as I said you know doing content this means that by the time I make videos deck lists or anything right for a certain set it's already invalid <laughs> it does feel like that sometimes <laughs> Uh, what do you, what do you think, Richard? I'm still on Modern Horizons too. I don't know about you guys. I'm not even done with like, and I, I look right. It, Modern Horizons two released June eighteenth. That's just literally like two months ago. I haven't picked up my paper cards yet. I'm still exploring like commander cards from it. I don't know what happened with Realms Forgotten. I don't know what happened with Jumpstart. Like all these cards just went by. I don't have time to process them. I just like see the very top cards right like the very ones that everyone's talking about but i don't have a chance to look at like the underplayed stuff right like the the kind of niche cards right you just don't have time for any of this so i i do think it's a real problem and i do think that's what's leading to like homogenized formats and things like that like people just don't have time to explore uh you know like when you're a kid and like if you have just one toy you find like all kinds of ways to play with that one toy, right? Like you use your imagination and like you just go nuts. But if your parents are feeding you a new toy every day, you just play with it superficially, throw it up, you know, throw it away, go on to the next one. Uh, I, I feel the first one is better, right? There, there's some medium between them, but I feel I don't like... I that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like exploring and like 
coming up with cards that like no one has thought of and like you know like doing that kind of thing i barely have time to like put a cart together like ship you know order something before the next set is out so it's it's too much like i we go through all the previews like nothing sticks in my head anymore because like it's so fast you're like oh is this removal good i don't know but we're gonna get more removal in like two minutes so you know on to the next one right like who cares right like keep going it's, it's I, just I guess too much. I like that. Be- I, I do. I do like the idea of, I guess, <laughs> perpetually being in spoiler season. Uh, like it is it, it's something that I kind of like helps. I, I think it helps the fact that Arena is now moving towards or Magic has a digital client. Right. We We originally wanted new cards and all this other stuff. So now we're getting new cards and we're getting them a lot more often. And it's I think it's partially that this increased rate is because now there's arena, which is a digital client and we experience metas so much faster. So as somebody who likes playing with new cards, I think this is like pretty chill. And the fact that arena is now digital or magic's digital uh, or has a ton of digital presence, this is great for streaming, but pre-recorded content, all that stuff, that's miserable. <laughs> Yeah, I I feel like from Wizards perspective, if you look at the last couple of months, what they're thinking is, OK, Modern Horizons, that's something for like modern and legacy players. No one else has to care about that. Standard players, arena players, they, they don't even have to look at the spoilers. And then you have Adventures of Forgotten Realms, which is kind of for everyone because it's in standard. Then you have this Historic Horizons, which, you know, if you're a modern player or a standard player or a, any non arena historic player, you could just safely ignore it, pretend like it didn't even exist. And then you go to Innistrad and that's a set for everyone. So I think that's how Wizards is viewing it is like there's so many products. Not everyone should be paying attention to everything. And you need to you need to learn just to ignore things and this pretend like certain sets don't even you. exist. The, uh, so I think that's Wizards take, although I don't know. I, I think that that's a hard it's actually like a tough sell for a couple of reasons, with one being that's not how magic usually or used to be like I, I was trained that you get four sets a year and maybe a supplemental product and you know every spoiler season is a celebration and everyone the community kind of comes together and it's this big thing so the idea to me that like sets are being spoiled and you should just pretend like they don't exist is just so much different that it's it's kind of hard to wrap my mind around and the other thing is like because commander is so big and it, discounting historic horizon since it's a arena exclusive every set is relevant to commander i feel like that eh, to some extent pushes commander players to have to stay at least somewhat informed on every single set i guess the good news is commander's a casual format so if you skip some sets like it's not like you're gonna lose a tournament or whatever but i think the incentive is there so i think it could be a little bit more spaced out even like for me even if you had to release all these products I don't see a reason why we had to start Innistrad spoilers three weeks early, the day after Historic Horizons came out. Like, there, I don't see what the the real benefit of that is. Like, if you're not starting spoiler season until like the 23rd or the 30th, why did we have to have it? You know, the day after Jumpstart Historic Horizons, why not like do something cool for the set you just finished spoiling, and then start Innistrad spoilers a week or two later? So even if Wizards wants to release and needs to release products on this super fast schedule, I feel like at least you could space out the spoilers a little bit more and give sets a, a little time to breathe. Like there's some cool stuff I want to try to do in Historic Horizons, and it almost makes me a little sad because during Historic Horizons spoilers, I was like, oh, I want to build ninjas, I want to build the Affinity deck, I want to build this, I want to build enchant. But now I'm like, oh, it, it, am I even going to do that? Or are all these ideas that I had just going to go to waste because it's we're on Dana Strad already? Like, is Magic just like looking at spoilers? <laughs> is that what the game is now? You just look at the spoilers and think about what you would like to do with the cards, but then new spoilers come out and you never get to realize any of those ideas that you've had. So, so I think the pacing, even with the current release schedule, could be could be a little bit better so that would be i think the easiest thing that i think maybe wizards could uh 
could take and fix as far as spoilers because the hype's there and they, i can see an argument that giving people a chance to play with their cards a little bit for a week before jumping into the next spoiler season uh, that might actually be a positive thing and keep the hype going rather than just jumping right into the next spoiler season as quickly as possible i i do love having new toys constantly <laughs> so I, in a weird way, love and hate our our spoiler pace here. So I think Wizards I, needs I to like take, to, uh, take a look on like modern game development where they slow things down. They intentionally gate things to keep it casual, right? Like all MMOs now, like time gate uh, your content so that you play at like a nice sustainable pace. You don't burn yourself out. Uh, there's content that's like evenly distributed. Uh, rather than just like piling it on so that you have to grind like 80 hours the first week uh, because that like makes you not want to play, right? Like for some people, like, yeah, I'm bored. I want to grind 80 hours. But for other people, they're like, well, if I don't grind 80 hours, I'm going to fall behind. So I might as well just not play. Uh, And a lot of games are going towards that model now. So I hope Wizards catches on. Like we're getting old, man. Like I don't have time is, to like look at spoilers for eight hours a day and like build text, right? Like I don't have time to keep up with this, right? And if I'm too far removed from it, I'm not going to bother, right? So I don't bother with legacy now because by the time I get up to speed, it's already changed again. So it's like too much for me, right? I can only keep up with like commander, standard, modern, like that's it, right? I'm like getting too old for this. It's, it's too old. <laughs> is my my concern would be more so can they sustain this because if i get conditioned to this high speed environment of constant flow of cards content all that stuff can you maintain this because if you cannot then it becomes problematic much like how we were originally used to the whole four sets you know the old release schedule right like ah four times a year i get a new set nice and easy now i let's say i get used to this new set every 30 minutes then I am expecting that. And can Wizards do that on a small, like with a, I don't know how big their team is for this. I hope it gets bigger and they like hire more people because you're going to have to sustain this. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, when they were doing like the embedded views for tournaments. And one of the things we talked about is like, uh, yeah, I mean, that that looks great why it's happening, why you're embedding the tournaments in your arena that has 150,000 people, according to Twitch stats. That's great, but you got to keep doing it because when you stop doing it and your tournament has 2000 people, then the narrative is, oh, my God, how do you go from 150,000 people to 2000 people? What's the matter with your game? And I feel like the same thing could happen if all of a sudden you went back to four sets a year. People are going to be like, wow, Magic must be doing horribly. Like, why did they cut back so much on their product line? Uh, so I think that is a concern. My other concern would be, like, can they keep the quality up with this heavy of a workload? And I think, as you mentioned, Krim, like, maybe it's going to be essential to just, like, get more people in the building and more people to help with this. Because if you have the, the same number of people, it's accelerated so quickly. If you have roughly the same number of people that were making Magic, like, two or three years ago, when there were, like, 10 sets a year, now making, you know, 30, 40 sets a year, counting all the secret layers and stuff, that's... Uh, a huge increase in the workload so that's my other concern would just be like can you keep the quality up are we going to see more broken cards are we going to see more like you know misprints erratas typos like that kind of stuff that magic has traditionally been pretty good about but are we going to see the quality decline just because you know because of how much work people are putting into this and how much uh, they're trying to keep up with so my biggest question is can my wallet keep up with it also true (laughs) Right. Like, uh, have we even started collecting Jumpstart Horizons? Right. And, you know, have we are we done with AFR? Like, have your AFR pre-orders even come in right before you're already like trying to buy like Midnight Hunt stuff? Right. And, you know, there's going to be some commander decks coming up with Midnight Hunt, obviously, as well. And then, of course, there'll be a secret layer in time for Christmas. So, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, on that note, we went uh, we went a little bit long. Do we have any fish mail questions today? Maybe we can sneak in like one or two, Richard. All uh, right. Fish mail us. If you have questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions <clears throat> on air. Uh, accordingly, 23, have you guys ever gone back to early Commander Clash or podcast from time to time to see how your views have changed? Views of Commander. <laughs> 
Uh, that would actually be a good idea. Uh, I, I think that would be pretty interesting. I know I was writing an article the other day and it referenced one of the first Budget Magic episodes and I wanted to link it. So I incidentally like watched one of the very first videos that uh, that I'd ever made. And yeah, I feel like uh, hopefully I've improved a lot over the years. Like the sound is different and it, it was very, very weird. So going back to watch old stuff is weird, but it would be interesting to see how some of our like views on the format have developed over time. That could be a cool, a cool like stats video or something. Yeah, they, they definitely changed. Like I, I know like cards that I used to put in decks, I would no longer put in decks today, even though like other people would still put them in. Like they're still meta relevant. Um even like, I, I know a lot of people like like to discuss power levels and play groups and commander. Like everyone is at a different point in their commander career when you're playing with them. Like if you've just started playing, like lab man may be like super cool to you. You'd be like, yeah, I drew my deck and I lab man or I thought his oracle. It's like the awesome, right? It's like so awesome. And you like try really hard to do it. But if you've been playing for like five years, like, oh, no, not another lab man win. Like, come on, dude. Right. So like people's views change as they play more and more magic. So I think it's just natural. And I think when you sit down and play with other people, just know that they're at a different place. Right. Some people are super hardcore. They need to win. They need to prove to themselves. They, you know, they have what it takes. Some people are like retired. They're like, whatever. I'm just here to play birds. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think everyone's views change a lot but it'll be interesting to go back and take a look and explicitly list things out like did we used to play rampant growth <laughs> solemns and all those other staples that we don't play anymore uh okay one last question since the new digital cards oh the big large since new digital cards would be silver bordered in paper what silver bordered cards would you want to see in arena Oh, Should they bring silver board the, into arena now that you have like digital only things and you basically have head of Urza going on? What cars do we want? Yes, to see? bring bring it to arena. Although I think I would still prefer it to stay silver bordered. I I don't know if I would want you know just all of like unhinged and unglued to be legal for tournament play. Uh, cheese stands alone maybe that would be i'm trying to think i don't know silver bordered cards that well but those are the cards i know least about uh cheese standalone is a sweet one maybe maybe rock lobster just because of the the song and the meme there are some funny ones the only cards i know are the rock paper scissors cards that people use yeah. for rock paper scissors i don't know any other <laughs> silver bordered cards but i think it would be fun the question is would people find it fun is it worth their time to program these cards and make like a one-off format um but that I mean, would be cool because we can never we we can never play these cards digitally ever before right moto never supported them uh so it'd be cool to have a digital place to play play the silver boarded cards all right yeah we've gone pretty. long so thank you to everyone who sent in questions this week uh, if you have questions, send them to at MG Goldfish with the hashtag MG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. And I believe that that brings us to the end of episode 341 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So, Richard Krim, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we will be back next week to talk about whatever goes on in the world of magic. So, until then, have an amazing week, everyone. And this is the crew signing out.